Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about homeostasis. And this concept is really the most important concept we're going to learn in AMP 1 and 2. So homeo means same and stasis means stable. So if you take those two together, same, stable, it basically means that homeostasis is what your body does to maintain a stable internal environment. This doesn't mean your body never changes. In fact, your body is always changing based on what you're doing and what the external environment or the outside is doing. Let's look at an example of homeostasis of body temperature. So humans have a set point for body temperature, what we would call the normal value. And our normal value is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. But when our body temperature gets too far away from that normal value, outside the range of normal, it triggers a response in the body to try to bring it back to normal range. For example, if you step outside on a very cold day, your body temperature might start to fall because you're losing body heat. Once that body temperature falls enough, your body will react and start th doing things to fix that low level, bringing it back up to normal. Conversely, if you go outside on a very hot day, your body temperature might start to rise. And your body will have to react differently to bring the body temperature back down again. You might also see body temperature rise or fall depending on your activity levels. Strenuous exercise raises body temperature while laying around and watching TV might allow it to fall. So your temperature fluctuates all the time, up and down, based on both external and internal factors. We call these fluctuations homeostatic loops. The loop is a change in the set point followed by the process the body uses to bring it back to normal. Now temperature is just one example of a set point. There are many, many others. I've included them up in the top right here. All of these change all the time with exposure to different environments or different activities. So body temperature is pretty obvious, but think about your blood pressure. Your blood pressure can go up and down depending on all kinds of things in the body, even your mood. You get angry, your blood pressure probably goes up. Um, your glucose levels go up and down based on how recently you've eaten. Osmolarity of the blood, so it's basically the concentration of the blood, can go up and down depending on how hydrated you are. So these are changing all the time, and homeostasis is the body attempting to keep them right around where they need to be. So maintaining homeostasis is a huge job in the body. Let's talk about the specifics of a homeostatic loop. Go ahead and get out a piece of paper so you can draw along with me. Ready? There are several components to a homeostatic loop. No matter which system we're talking about, we use common words to describe each part of the loop. We've already talked about a set point and how it can get too high or too low. When it gets outside of normal range, this is called a stimulus. So a stimulus is something measured that deviates away from the set point or normal value. I kind of nicknamed this Goldilocks because we really want to keep in that normal range. Once we get too high or too low, the body doesn't like it. That's what the stimulus is, anything outside of that normal range. Remember that the stimulus is a value that is measured in the body. So it's not what you did. It's not whether you ate or didn't eat or whether you went outside or didn't go outside. It's really just something that goes away from normal set point, what can be measured. Once we have an abnormal set point, the control center receives this information and it makes a decision on what to do. We can name, nickname the control center the boss because it makes these decisions and it tells everybody else what to do and everybody else has to do what it says. You might think that the control center is always the brain, but sometimes it's other parts of the body, and we'll learn about that later in the course. The control center then sends instructions to the effectors. 
the effectors are sort of the enforcers. The parts of the body that carry out what the control center says to do. We have a couple of different effectors. They can either be muscles or glands. Most of the time, the effectors are told to bring the rogue values back to normal. We call this negative feedback. So if we get rid of the stimulus, we've negated it. If we no longer have a stimulus, that's negative feedback. But occasionally, some systems, the effectors do things to increase the st stimulus, to make the stimulus actually higher. And that's called positive feedback. Positive and negative don't relate to whether it's good or bad for the body. It's just really whether you're increasing or decreasing the stimulus. Increasing the stimulus is positive feedback. Decreasing the stimulus is negative feedback. So these are our main components. Stimulus, control center, effector. But we were missing some stuff. How does the control center know that there's a stimulus? As the body temperature rises, how does this control center know it's rising? Well, we need something called a receptor. These are often neurons that are triggered by the stimulus. Receptors bring information about the stimulus to the control center. Likewise, how does the control center tell the effectors what to do? We use instructions, which are usually either hormones or nervous system signals, to tell the effector what they're supposed to do. And then what do the effectors actually do? Well, that's called the action. So that's what the effectors do, either to increase the stimulus or decrease the stimulus. And there you have the loop. Now, we didn't talk about any of these systems yet, so let's go back to temperature homeostasis and see how it looks when we put the specifics of temperature homeostasis on this loop. Right now, at the beginning of the semester, we're just learning these generic components. What we're going to do next is I'm going to show you how the specifics can change the loop and change the outcome. So you don't need to know these specifics quite yet. Let's put some specifics on here for temperature homeostasis. We've already talked about how you can have a temperature that's too high or a temperature that's too low. There are different loops. Even though they're both about body temperature, they're different loops, and so they're going to have different components. So let's talk about body temperature being too high. So as your body temperature rises, either it's hot outside and you're getting hot, or more likely you're exercising and you're generating all kinds of excess heat, that's going to be picked up by a specific kind of receptor called a thermoreceptor. So we'll learn about types of receptors when we get to the nervous system. And the control center that oversees your body temperature is called the hypothalamus. That's in the brain. So as the body temperature rises, a thermoreceptor will tell the hypothalamus that it's getting too high. The control center is going to see that there's a problem and it's going to send out instructions in the form of nervous system signals to effectors that's going to basically take care of this problem. In this case, it's going to be your sweat glands and the smooth muscle around your vessels. And those effectors are going to do a particular action. Now, we don't want our body temperature to keep going up. We actually want to bring our body temperature back to normal. So we're going to use negative feedback and we're going to allow our sweat glands to sweat, which will cool us off by evaporation. And we're going to dilate those blood vessels, which allows us to lose some body heat to the outside air, which is usually colder than body temperature. So all of these things that we've seen in here are going to work together to get rid of this stimulus. So this is a negative feedback loop because by the end, once we're sweating and we've dilated our blood vessels, it will gradually bring our body temperature back to normal levels, back to that 37 degrees Celsius. So you can see that we used all of our generic components and all we did was put these specifics on top of it. Let's talk about another homeostatic loop 
This time, let's talk about childbirth. So as you're growing a baby, the baby gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's more and more pressure in the uterus. And as it gets bigger, it gets heavier, and it starts putting a lot of pressure on the cervix. And at some point, right about 40 weeks of pregnancy, that stimulus gets so high, it triggers a receptor called a baroreceptor. Now that receptor is specialized to pick up changes in pressure. And if they get too high, the baroreceptor will fire and it's going to tell the control center, which happens to also be the hypothalamus. So even though the uh, temperature and childbirth both have a hypothalamus as their control center, it's not always the hypothalamus. It just happens to be this is the one I picked. So the hypothalamus is gonna send out instructions to the effector. And the instructions in this case are gonna be hormones. In fact, it's a hormone called oxytocin. Um, if you have ever had a baby, you might have gotten pitocin in the hospital to increase the strength of contractions. It, that's a um, synthetic oxytocin. And the hormone is gonna act on the smooth muscle of the uterus, that's our effector. And the action that that's going to do is it's actually gonna cause contraction of the uterus. And if you think about it, as you contract the uterus and you're pressing on the baby, what's happening to our stimulus? It's actually increasing, right? So as we contract the uterus and we push on the baby, the pressure on the cervix is actually going up. So this is one of those rare cases where we have positive feedback, where this loop goes through and instead of getting rid of our stimulus, we actually increased our stimulus. And this goes on and on and on, increasing the pressure, more hormones are released, more contraction happens until eventually the baby does get pushed out. At that point, the pressure is gone and we can shut down the loop. But the initial response to pressure on the cervix is actually going to be to create more pressure on the cervix. So that's how we get that positive homeostatic loop. So what's interesting here is we have the same components. We Both of them have a stimulus, which is basically some value outside of normal. Both of them have a control center. Both happen to be the hypothalamus, but not always. Both of them are gonna send out instructions and have infectors that are gonna do something. And sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative feedback. So same components, different loops. We can write these loops out for every single one of these different situations. All of these different things have their own loops with their own specifics. You can imagine that when homeostasis cannot be achieved, this is when you have pathology. We're gonna be coming back to these concepts again and again over the two semesters, and we'll spend time learning how different body systems work together to maintain homeostasis and health. So one final thought I wanna leave you with, what you have drawn here is called a box and line model. Or maybe it's better described as a box and arrow model because I have little arrows at the top of my lines. But these are very useful. They, we use these to show different processes in class and it can be helpful to organize and visually present the data. So this is just a little trick for you to use if you're struggling to understand the physiology. Use a box and line model. Thanks for listening. See you in class.